I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to say goodbye from uh, the video for right now. So I'll come, I'll show up again later in our time together today. All right, so let's get started. This webinar is the first in a series of four about PubMed. It is designed to give you a tour and introduction of PubMed features. PubMed is a free online tool provided by the National Library of Medicine, also known as NLM. NLM is one of the National Institutes of Health, and it's run, funded by United States tax dollars. PubMed is one of the largest and most comprehensive databases of biomedical journal literature in the world. I'm here today to show you how it works. So let's look at our agenda. We are going to start with an introduction to the PubMed database, what it is, and what's in it. Then we'll explore PubMed features together and discover how to accomplish some of the most common PubMed tasks. Finally, we'll look at how to get help and some additional training resources. At the end of today's session, you'll get a link to the evaluation, which has information about claiming continuing education credit from the Medical Library Association. So let's talk about PubMed. What's in PubMed? PubMed is the National Library of Medicine's free authoritative database of more than 36 million citations for articles in the fields of biomedicine and health, with a specific focus on collecting original scientific research. It's used by over 3 million unique users every day, including clinicians, researchers, students, librarians, and the general public. And there's many ways that you can use PubMed. You can use it to find a specific research article based on some known information you have about an article. You can use PubMed to find articles written by a particular author. You can use PubMed to familiarize yourself with a topic and because of its vast scope, you can take a deep dive into a wide variety of topics. PubMed even has patient education handouts and I'll show you how to add that filter to find some of those later today. So you may ask, does PubMed have full text? What can you expect? PubMed is a database of citations, not a database of full text articles. Nearly 75% of PubMed citations include links to full text. And if you look at articles published in the last 10 years, almost 95% of them provide full text links. But there's a difference between full text and free full text. Some of the links in PubMed may take you to a publisher site, which may require a subscription or one-time feed access. When a publisher provides free full text access, that link will be included in PubMed. And when available, PubMed includes links to full text from PubMed Central, also known as PMC. PMC PubMed Central is NLM's free full text repository. PMC was created in response to the NIH public access policy that was adopted by the United States Congress in 2009. The policy says that any publications that come out of research supported by an NIH grant must be made available to the public for free. And PubMed Central recently launched a new website design with a similar look and feel to PubMed. So I have a question for you and you can answer in chat. If someone asked you if PubMed was a database of free full text articles, what would you say, yes or no? Let me know in chat. If someone asked you if PubMed was a database of free full text articles, how would you answer, yes or no? Okay, and I am seeing a lot of responses, a lot of no's here. I got a depends, not directly, not exactly. Thank you so much for responding in chat. The answer we teach in this class is no. PubMed is a database of citations to articles. Full text in PubMed is not always available or free. Now uh, we're sharing a link 
to a fact sheet in the chat box that talks about the relationship between PubMed, Medline, and PubMed Central. It's also on your handout. That get, can give you a little more information about the differences in relationship between PubMed, PubMed Central, and Medline. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit uh, about PubMed and some of the built-in features. One of the most common ways PubMed is used is to locate a specific article based on some known information you have about the article. Say you come across a news story like the one on the slide. This is a 2019 story from the National Public Radio reporting on research that showed that the common treatment for asthma may not be as effective as previously believed. Now, the online version of this article had a convenient link back to the original research, but that's not always the case. You might see an article listed in the reference section of a paper or hear about it on news or social media. So let's see if we can track this article down. So what do we know about the original research article referenced in this article? <laughs> I've highlighted the clues on the slide. We know that it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. We know that the article from NPR was from 2019, so it's probably an article published in 2019. And we see here on the slide that the lead author is Stephen Lazarus, a pulmonologist at the University of California, San Francisco. And honestly, just this little bit of information should be enough for us to find the article very easily in PubMed. So let's go into PubMed and see what we find. So I'm going to go to PubMed now. If you can, open another browser window and work along with me. Otherwise, you can sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. And Margie has shared a direct link to PubMed in chat if you would like to follow along, if you're available and capable of doing that. So now uh, we're going to move into the live hands-on demonstration of the course. Um, now, the first thing I'd like to talk about is one of the key design features of PubMed. Um, and one of the key design features of PubMed are the sensors that are built into the search box the search box right here. And that's sensors with an S. The PubMed search sensors analyze your search terms and try to detect exactly what you're looking for. So if we enter the information we have about that example article, the author's last name, the journal abbreviation, and the year, PubMed's citation sensor should detect that we entered some basic information about the article and will help us find what we're looking for. So if you're following along, go ahead and type Lazarus NEJM 2019 into the search box and click search. This is example A on your handout and then we also shared the search example in chat. So we have Lazarus NEJM, that's the abbreviation for New England Journal of Medicine, and the year 2019. Going to press search. So now we're looking at the search results page, which PubMed calls the summary view. And notice towards the top, highlighted in blue with this information icon, we see an alert, three articles found by citation matching. So PubMed's citation sensor used a fuzzy matching algorithm to find citations that might be a match for the article we're looking for. In this case, PubMed thinks that one of these top three articles might be a match. And we see that the third article has all the pieces of the information that we put into the search box, the author's name, the journal, and the date. PubMed also runs our search normally, if you will, and gives us an alternative set of results just in case we were trying to find something else. And we'll look at what's going on in the bottom of these search results a little bit later. But for now, I'm going to click on the third result from our example 
to look at a citation in more detail. So I'm going to click on this third link at the top of the screen to look at a citation in more detail. So when you click on the title of an article in PubMed, we're taken to what PubMed calls the abstract view of an article. And up at the top, we have some basic information. When you hover your mouse over the journal title abbreviation, notice that the full title of the journal displays. We also see the date, volume, issue, and page numbers of the journal, as well as the uh, DOI. Now, to the left of this citation info, info, we have a tag right here that says randomized controlled trial. Now, this tag may vary depending on what type of article you're, look at, you're looking at, but in this case, the article is reporting on a randomized controlled trial. And it's uh, good to note that not every type of article will have a tag, but PubMed highlights commonly looked for publication types, such as reviews, clinical trials, or case reports. And a DOI, I see a question in, in chat, that stands for Document Object Identifier. And we can get you more information on that uh, in just a little bit, but I wanna keep unpacking what this abstract view looks like in PubMed. So underneath all of this citation info, we have in a larger font, the title of the article. Immediately to the right, we have those full text links. And if you're using a device with a smaller screen, like on a phone or something like that, these full text links will appear below the, um, the title of the article. Now, these full text links have both a link to the publisher's website, as well as a link to a free copy of the article in PubMed Central. Depending on where you're located, how you're logged in, you might also see a library icon. If your library participates in a program called Linkout for Libraries, you might see a link to your library's full text access right here. So that's unpacking those full text links that are over there on the right or underneath the, um, this information if you're on a smaller screen. Now, below the title, we have a number of authors. All of this is the author information. This list can be really long and it could have hundreds of authors and collaborators. Now we can expand all of those authors and collaborators by clicking the plus sign next to expand. I'm gonna scroll down just a little bit. Collaborators affiliations. So if we click the expand, we can see all of the collaborators and affiliations, and it's a very long list. You can also collapse that information by clicking the minus sign again. Okay, and below all of those authors, collaborators, and affiliations, we have something called the PMID. It's this number right here. PMID stands for PubMed Identifier. The PubMed Identifier is a unique number and every citation in PubMed has one. I'm calling this out because this is um, the answer to number one on your handout, if you're following along. The unique number for a PubMed citation is called the PMID, um, or PubMed identifier, and every single citation in PubMed has one of these. Why am I telling you this? Well, if you have the PMID, you can always find the citation by typing that number into the search box and clicking search. Um, and just the, just the numbers, you don't need to put PMID. If you put PMID, it's not gonna find it. But if you, if you type in a sequence of numbers, it will take you to that direct citation. You can also enter multiple PMIDs at the same time if you need to find a specific number. And I'll just show you what that looks like. Um, so here I have three PMIDs to three different journal articles, and I've separated them by a space. And if I click search, I will then retrieve 
those three articles. And we can see the first one is that article we were just looking at, and then here's two more that refer to those PMIDs that we searched up here. Kind of go back to our abstract view. That PMID um, hack is, is pretty useful if you are always looking for that one article and you just have, you can just write that on your hand and go on your way and run to the library and type back into pubmed.gov. Um, okay, so directly below the PMID, we have the abstract. An abstract tells you what the article is about. And most articles have an abstract, which are provided by the publisher. PubMed displays what the publisher provides. We don't create abstracts. PubMed does not create abstracts. So whatever the publisher submits as the abstract is what is provided in PubMed. We don't create one. Um, but the abstract is a, is a fast way to tell what this uh, article is about. Now notice over here on the right again, we have a menu page navigation. And this is an easy way to jump between sections of an abstract without scrolling. Um, and notice that there's a number of different pieces of information contained on this page. Um, one I want to point out is similar articles. It's a popular feature. And basically what it does uh, is it, it uses an algorithm based on the terms from the abstract and title of a particular article um, to bring in other PubMed citations that are similar to the one you're looking at. Uh, by default, you get five similar articles displayed in the abstract, but you can see all the similar articles by clicking on a link. Um, and we do have a, a link that discusses how PubMed identifies those similar articles on the handout, and Margie just shared it in chat as well if you're curious about how that algorithm works. Um, so similar articles is, is, a, is a useful feature on any abstract in PubMed. There's also an option to view articles uh, that cite the article you're looking at. It's called Cited By. This uh, piece of the abstract is generated using data submitted by publishers and from other resources when available. So it is not a complete list of works citing a particular item. So just keep that in mind. Uh, we, there is a list of cited by articles, but it is not a comprehensive view of everything, every article that has cited that article. Uh, but it is a way to explore other research in the, in the area. I'm going to hop back up to that page navigation menu, um, and I welcome you to explore some of the other pieces of the abstracts that are available. Are, is there anything interesting uh, here to you in the abstract view? Uh, let me know in the search box. We looked at similar articles and cited by, but there's a, a number of other um, pieces of information in, in the PubMed abstract that might be useful. What other interesting things do you see in the abstract view? Methods, oh yes, the abstract view. Um, yes, and then, and also, uh, thank you, Annie, yes, the, uh, the method, methods definitely is an important piece of any abstract. Definitely want to have those in there. Um, and then, uh, let's see, Elizabeth, I'd like to see the figures. Yes, figures uh, will include any uh, figures that are included in an article, and the nice thing about this is it will expand them. So here we see the um, randomized controlled trial design, um, and that just opens up. Uh, MeSH headings, that's uh, MeSH stands for medical subject headings, and, and we'll unpack those a little bit more today. Um, and let me show you what that looks like. It's MeSH terms. If you go down, these are all, um, these are all subject headings associated with this article. Um, and Annie says, I always jump to conclusions. <laughs> we all do that from time to time, don't we? Well, thanks so much for exploring the page navigation uh, here with me. We're going to cover a number of those today um, as we work through what's uh, the introduction to PubMed. Um, but just know, um, especially if you're a new user, that this page navigation menu is on every um, abstract view of an article in PubMed, and it allows you to easily jump to different pieces of information in the abstract. Okay. 
I am uh, don't see any questions in the chat um, and I, I welcome you to please uh, at, if you have questions please put them in the chat and I'm happy to answer them um, is there a way to save the chat uh, we um, I we will get back to you on that I um, I, I don't have step-by-step directions off the top of my head, uh, whether you can save the chat, but uh, we can certainly save it uh, when we post-process it. Okay. Um, all right. So thanks for your question, Lee. Uh, we're going to go ahead and, and keep moving on. Um, I'd like to point out that uh, there's a PubMed logo on the top left. I'm going to click on that to go back to the PubMed homepage. It's always that PubMed logo on the left um, of almost every single PubMed page is a quick way back to a fresh search box. So you're, um, if you need to calm down, uh, you can always click that PubMed logo. It will take you back to the PubMed homepage. Um, oh, uh, Bethany, late breaking question. Uh, curious about the site option. Uh, will you be demonstrating that? Well, yes, we will. Um, it just a little bit, uh, give me about 15 minutes and we're going to look at it. Um, first, I want to talk about author searching because that is another super popular way that people use PubMed almost every single day. It's one of the most frequent tasks that users do is they're trying to find all publications by a specific author. And searching by author can be tricky. Um, multiple authors might have the same name, like there's only over 1,300 M NAPs in PubMed. Um, or you might have an author that publishes under different names. Um, so so there, there can, be, can be pretty tricky. But there's a few techniques that you can use to help find articles by, this, by the author that you want. Now, the most effective way to search for an author is to use the author's last name and initials. You can use up to two initials in PubMed, but using only the first initial is going to run the most comprehensive author search. Another thing to note is there's no need to tag or capu capitalize or punctuate the names. Just enter the last name, then a space, then the initials of your author. So going back to our example, if we wanted to look for articles by Stephen Lazarus, that author from our early example, the pulmonologist from University of California, you would enter his last name, a space, and his first initial. Um, and I just want to say before I search, we recommend last name, space, first initial instead of the author's full name because not all PubMed records include full author names. And in fact, PubMed only began accepting full names in 2002, and not all publishers supply the full name. So if you search a full name in PubMed, you may miss some results. So that's why we recommend best practice, last name, space, first initial. And as I mentioned at the very beginning of this class, this is a four-part series on, uh, on PubMed, on how PubMed works, and we go into much greater detail about author searching in our class on automatic term mapping, and that should be happening uh, either uh, next week uh, or the week after. So if you're following along, go ahead and type in that Lazarus S example into the PubMed search box and click search. And that is the, um, and that is search example B on your handout. Okay, so we did a search for our author, Lazarus S. And uh, we can see in the results that we have a number of articles, over almost 500, uh, by an S, uh, S. Lazarus. And we also have a number um, of articles by a Lazarus SC. And those names are bolded in our search results here. Now, he is a pulmonologist, and we see some articles that reflect that. And that's one clue we can use to determine whether we have the right author on an article. 
so what I'm going to do is look at this first result um, to see if this is the Lazarus that we are looking for. Okay, so <clears throat> in the massive, in the list of author names that you get underneath the title, you have um, numbers that next to an author name that indicates the affiliation of the author. So if we look at this Stephen C. Lazarus and hover our mouse over the number two next to his name, we can see that this is indeed the Dr. Lazarus that we're looking for um, from the University of California. So from here, if we wanted to see more publications by the same author, uh, we can use a feature in PubMed that's called computed author sort. And using this is very easy. All you have to do is when you're in an abstract view, just click on an author's name and PubMed will use an algorithm to give you back a result list of authors that they are sure is the author you are looking for, in this case, Stephen Lazarus. Notice at the very uh, top of our search results, again with the information icon in blue, there's an alert that says results are displayed in computed author sort. So what is computed author sort? Because an author may have the same name as other authors, the objective of computed author sort is to display additional relevant results by an author. So when you click on an author's name from within a citation, the, author name, the author's name disambiguation process uh, kicks in and compares citations with the same author name. And it looks at similarity of co-authors, journals, article titles, affiliations, a variety of, of um, factors. And then it gives you back a results list of what the algorithm determines to be most likely by the author um, in a list. Margie's shared um, a link uh, with more information about the algorithm beh behind computed author sort. But the bottom line is, uh, if you want to quickly f uh, pull up a list of articles by a known author, all you have to do is click into the abstract view of an article, and here we are in the abstract view, and then click an author's name. And here is our Stephen Lazarus again. Click the author's name, and that will execute the computed author sort, search, and give you a list of results. So if you're following along on the handout, um, question number two asks, which PubMed view do you need to get the computed author sort message to appear? And the answer to that is the abstract view. You can pull up any PubMed citation in abstract view, click on, click on an author's name to see articles most likely to be by that author. Um, now let's see, I know uh, there were a couple of questions that came up in the chat box. Just gonna peek over at them really fast. Okay, so, um, Okay, so the first question is turning on captions for webinars. Um, yes, if you, uh, Lee, if you look at the bottom of the screen under the more menu, which has three dots, um, there should be an option uh, to use the automatic captions available. And uh, please uh, let us know if you continue to have challenges with that and we'll, try, we'll work with you to, to get that working. So the next, Question is, uh, what if an author published when they were at another institution? Um, that is where the computed author sort will use other features of um, the metadata, the information that's in the abstract view uh, to determine whether it is um, the same author or not. So it, it would look at, for example, um, subject heading terms, um, similar journals that they have published in. Um, so that's, uh, it is, it is uh, one caveat with computed author sort. It is an algorithm. So it is, it, there is a, there is room for error there. Um, 
and generally with this list of computed author sort um, results, they, uh, articles that appear at the closer to the top of the search results are a higher likelihood of being the same author. Um, the further down that you, the further you get into the search results, the less likely they would be by the same author. So I hope that um, answers that. Uh, the next question is, um, with a computed author sort, you don't have to worry it will miss relevant articles from the full set of results from the Lazarus at search. Yes, Elizabeth, that's the um, intention of computed author sort is um, an algorithm is triggered when you click on an author's name in the abstract view um, that will call up articles that are most likely to be by the article by the author that you seek but it is not there is room for error as I said so the closer that those results are to the top of the results the more likely it is to be by your author um, some some uh, human checking is still required um, but this is a way to I identify um, articles most likely to be by the author you're looking for. Okay, the next question is, are all links shared in chat also in the handout? Yes, uh, all links are in the handout and uh, we can share that one more time. Um, the next question, um, okay, uh, Irma, thank you so much. We will, um, I don't have time to, check that date directly but um but I but we will we will get back to you Margie maybe you can check that and and let Irma know confirm the date of selection okay um and thank you all uh for the help with the captions I am in a presenter view so I my screen is a little looking a little different and thank you also uh everyone for pointing out that description discrepancy with the dates and the day of the week and we'll we'll get that updated as soon as soon as we can um okay the now i wanted to see if you the next question if you only wanted to see lazarus s and not lazarus sc can you use the computed author sort in the same manner or is it easier to refine the initial search um well uh if you were let's let's find out going to okay so I'm in a computed author sort view so let me go back um, and find an article that has just Lazarus S in it there's a lot of SC isn't there let's do Lazarus oh um, I will have to get back to you on that. I don't have a, a question. I don't have a direct answer for you right now, Bethany, but bear with me. Um, we, as I said, we will make sure to download this chat transcript and share answers to these questions when we, we send out the recording later today. Okay, so next question. Do authors get to have input into the list of articles associated with their names? Um, that is a great question, Lee. Uh, generally, when, when you publish, uh, you do in the pre-publication process, you, you do verify um, your name. I, I don't, um, and there is, you are able to contact the National Library of Medicine if you notice an error in publication data to get that corrected. Um, and that is through the NCBI Help Desk, which, um, is available at the bottom of every page in PubMed. Uh, so you can get to the help, which right here. So um, you can you can contact NLM to to correct that. Yes, thank you. Nancy uh, just shared a wonderful way to search for just Lazarus S. Uh, she's using a, a tag, AU, that's an author tag. And um, Margie also shared um, a, a link to the P full PubMed training that we have coming up today. And I believe that um, we, in the automatic term mapping uh, portion of this series, we get in depth in how to use those field tags. Um, but yes, to answer answer that question about just getting the Lazarus S. That's that's one way that you can get to it. You guys are great. These are great questions. Thank you so much. Okay, so 
We've looked at two ways to search uh, for, for authors by the last name and first initial, and then we looked at how to use computed author sort from an abstract of a known author to find more articles by a specific author. Um, so those are the two things that we've looked at so far. Great job, everyone. Uh, I clicked on that PubMed logo to go back to a fresh, calm blue screen because we're going to shift gears now and talk about keyword searching, which is another common way that folks use PubMed. So people use keyword searching in PubMed to find information about a topic they don't know a lot about and they want to familiarize themselves with, or perhaps they're doing a deep dive into a particular subject. And either way, PubMed has some features that make it easy for you to just type what you're looking for into the search box and retrieve relevant results. And one of the features that we're going to look at is called the best match sort order, uh, which is a default sort used in PubMed. And uh, why, why do we use this best match sort order? So based on PubMed analytics and usage statistics, the overwhelming majority of users only look at the first few results of their search and rarely, if ever, go, back, go past the first page. So a main goal of development in PubMed is to make sure the best, most relevant, and current research shows up right at the top. And that's what we call the best match algorithm, which is a machine learning algorithm that places the most relevant citations based on your search terms at the top of your results. I'm telling you all of this because this is also the answer to number three in your handout. Best match is a machine learning algorithm that matches your search terms to the PubMed records in your results based on the article title, subject terms and abstract, and displays them by rank with the most relevant results appearing on the top. So let me give you an example of best match in action. I'm going to use an example, caregiver burden Alzheimer's. I'm going to go ahead and do a search for caregiver burden in Alzheimer's. And notice here that we get um, over 1,600 results. And in this menu, in kind of the middle top of the screen, it says sort by best match. So I'm going to use um, these display options here to change my sorting to most recent. And I want you to pay attention to the number of results and which one is number one. So best match, we have, uh, we have a journal article on caregiver burden and Alzheimer's. That is the best, most recent match to this keyword search. If we change to most recent, we still get over 1,600 results. We still have the same number of search results, uh, but the ordering of the result list has changed. So now we get the very most recent article on top as opposed to the most relevant article on top. I'm showing you this to um, give an example of how um, Best Match just sorts your results. It doesn't search for results separately. It's, it's a way to sort your results um, so that the best, um, most recent literature to matching your keyword terms appears on the top. So I'm going to just change my sorting back to best match again. Um, and Margie has shared a link uh, in chat talking more about the algorithm behind best match, if you'd like to know more. Um, really the bottom line uh, here about the keyword searching is regardless of what sort order you choose, you're working with the same number of results from your search. Um, and I'd just like to also point out that you can sort in a number of other ways. Uh, if you wanted to do a sort by first author, you can do that. You can also sort by journal, um, and all of these are exportable. So that's best match. That is one way that PubMed attempts to make your life easier with your keyword searching and results. But there is another feature in PubMed um, that's focused on taking simple keyword searches, like our search here, caregiver, bird, and Alzheimer's, and translating them into more elaborate, comprehensive searches that are done kind of behind the scenes. 
And PubMed, we, we call this in PubMed development automatic term mapping. Now, automatic term mapping, uh, there's so much information about it that we have developed an entire PubMed class about it called automatic term mapping. Um, and there is a live webinar coming out if, you, if you'd like to move on. Uh, if, you, if you'd like to learn more, um, for now, uh, I would like to uh, just kind of show you more about how um, this automatic term mapping uh, works with search results. So on your handout, there's a search example for acid reflux, and we're going to, to practice uh, finding some search results uh, about acid reflux in PubMed right now. So. I want to find some information about acid reflux. Um, I don't need to know what the proper scientific term name is for acid reflux. Um, I don't need to know any fancy search stuff like quotation marks or tags. I can just put the keywords into the search box and click search. And that's what I'm going to do now. I put in the terms acid reflux and I'm going to click search. And this basic search gave us a large number of search results. In the center of the page, we have our, our list of results in a summary view, um, and that's going to include less information than the abstract view, uh, but key information such as the title, the authors, the um, journal information and PMID, and a snippet of, um, of the abstract itself. Some articles will also have a tag at, that we, we remember that randomized controlled trial, that, that tag appears here. In this case, here, this article on acid reflux is a review article. Notice also that your search terms are bolded in your search results here. And as I start going down, I notice that there's terms that I did not type in that are also bolded, gastroesophageal. And I'm going to show you why that is in just a minute. Uh, but before we get to that, uh, I want to talk about sharing results. Uh, I, somebody asked about um, sharing the results and citing the results. Let's take a look at that really fast. Because um, there's a lot of different ways you can repurpose and share these results. And the first thing is uh, to the left of every article in your search results, you get two links. You get one to cite and one to share. The Cite button allows you to grab a properly form formatted citation in several different formats. Right now we're looking at the NLM format, but you may need uh, American Medical Association, American Psychological Association, or the Modern Language Association are all other options that you can easily format and copy um, and paste into uh, into any other thing uh, to, to grab that citation. If you want to download a citation, it's going to download as a .nbib file. Um, and this is the same format uh, that we've uh, been using in PubMed for a pretty long time. And it is um, it works uh, in tandem with uh, any of your citation management software, as long as you choose the .nbib file. So there's the cite button. It's pretty pretty handy. Um, there's also a share button directly underneath cite, and this is to share just this article. And it gives you options to share to X or Facebook, and you can also um, copy a permalink to the article, and that will give you a direct link back to the abstract of the article um, that you could put into an email to a researcher or, or save as you wish. Okay, so those, that is the cite and share button, and those uh, appear next to, um, and those appear next to the, uh, to the citation in the summary view of the search results. At the top of the screen, we have options to save, email, and send our citations. Um, you can Uh, you can email resor results to yourself or someone else using the email button at the top of your page. Um, 
and uh, the subject line is not um, available uh, to edit, um, but you can distinguish who you are sending from. So, um, and then you have options if you want to share all of your results um, or just a selection. So that is, uh, and you can also choose which format to, to send that citation in if you wanted the abstract view or the summary view. Um, so you can email citations from the top. Um, you can also send uh, citations to a citation manager or some other options here. Um, and then you can also save your citations uh, and that will create a text file that you can save to your computer. So these are some ways to um, repurpose results. We talked a little bit about um, ways to sort your uh, search results. We looked at the best match versus the most recent. And again, those that just changes the order um, of your um, search results. It doesn't do a different search completely. Um, so you can also uh, sort by first author and journal, as I mentioned. Um, so those are some other, other ways to do, to do that. Now, one other thing I wanted to point out here um, is just below the search box, we have something called Create Alert. And this is a feature to create an alert for a specific search. To use this, you have to sign into uh, my NCBI. Uh, and so you have to create a free NCBI account if you uh, don't have one. But this will allow you to create an alert. Um, and so uh, PubMed will automatically email you new results as they become available. Um, you can do research in your sleep by setting up alerts. Molly, there is a question. Um, okay. I, this is from Patricia. I uh, did not see how to choose the abstract view and or the list we are viewing. Oh, okay. Um, so I, uh, when you are choosing to save or email your results, notice that under format you get, um, you get, some, you get a summary view and you get an abstract view. And if you go to save, you get the summary view um, and you get an abstract view. You get a couple other options and save citations. So that just, um, those formats depend, it will let you, it'll either send you a little bit of information. The summary view is what we're looking at here, where you just get the title and the authors and the journal information. Um, the abstract view is going to send you um, a lot more information. So it's going to, to send you everything that we looked at in our first example where you get the page navigation. So you get a lot more information if you choose abstract. So um, I, I believe when you're repurposing results um, in, in your options for save and email, um, if you choose summary, you will get sent less information. If you choose abstract, you're going to get a lot of information. So it, it depends on what what you're interested in pulling. I think she says, uh, well, so, she, so she goes on to further say from the search, I meant initially the author search gave the abstract view, the keyword search gave the list view. Hmm. Yes. Um, so in a, a, initially when we did when we did the first author search for Lazarus, um, Whenever, whenever you're doing a search in PubMed, the default is going to give you the summary view here. When you click into a title, it's going to take you into the abstract view. Um, now you can uh, up change your display options as well. So if you wanted to look at um, abstracts in your search results, you can do that under your display options here. And it turns green when you've changed it. So in this case, um, we now get uh, the abstracts showing. Um, I hope that helped. OK, great, great. Thank you for confirming that. OK, so in this section, we, we played around a little bit with keyword search, um, but and, and we looked at uh, several ways that you can repurpose your search results. So if you're, if, you, if you're following along on our handout, question number four is um, what, are, what are five ways to repurpose your search results? And 
the five ways as we looked at is citing it. You can cite it. You can share it. You can save your results, email, um, or you, and uh, you can also create an alert. And you can also download to a citation manager. Um, so those are, those are several different ways that you, can, um, that you can repurpose your results from PubMed. Okay. And Margie, were there any more questions? No, I, I think we're good. Cool. All right, great. Thanks. All right, well, um, let's switch gears a little bit and uh, talk about how to narrow some search results. We had a, a nice big number with our acid reflux search, and I'm just going to pull that back up by searching acid reflux. 40,000 plus search results. Um, and unless you're doing a very thorough literature review, you probably want a smaller group of results to work through. And the filters on the, on the left side of PubMed are an effective way to filter your results. And we're going to explore that in a little, uh, a little bit. So let me just unpack uh, the filters here on the, on the left side of the page. Uh, the first thing that we have is a results by year graph. I like this because it gives you a really nice way to visualize trends in research because you can see when publications on a particular topic increase or decrease over time. So try searching COVID-19 um, for fun on your own time. Uh, but uh, the results by year um, is, is a way to limit by date. If I click this um, expand collapse timeline, which is indicated with the diagonal icons, um, this will give me a larger graphical view and I can use a slider to um, limit my results. Uh, to a smaller set, and then I can uh, reset my results if I want to as well. This icon with the arrow pointing uh, to a downward bracket is a way to download a CSV file. The only thing that this downloads are the citation counts by year. So this does not include the citations, it just gives you a numerical result by year of your keyword search. But could be useful, interesting. Um, so that's the results by year slider, and I, I can shrink this back down by clicking that expand collapse icon one more time. <clears throat> so, so that's the results by year slider. Next, uh, we have text availability, uh, and this is where you can um, restrict your results to only articles that have abstracts or free full text or full text. So if you, if you select full text, you may get some that are behind a paywall. Um, but those are some different ways that you can um, filter by text availability. Uh, further down, uh, associated data. Uh, this is a way to limit your results to articles that link to data. For example, if you are looking at a study associated with clinicaltrials.gov, limiting to associated data would give you links to that data. That's the article attribute. Um, and then under, further down, we have the article type filter, and that restricts your results to specific article types, um, like clinical trial or randomized controlled trial. Um, and these are study designs, so these are ways that you can find specific types of research articles. Um, this is customizable. There are a number of other article types available. These are just um, some of the more frequently used ones. Uh, so those are those are here, but uh, that this this list is entirely customizable under additional filters. Now, uh, publication date. We looked at that publication slider as the as the first filter on the top of these search results, but you can also just blanket limit by one year or five or ten. A lot of times uh, people limit searches to five years or you might have a custom date range that you need um, and you can enter in those customized start and end dates uh, for publication if you need that as well. Um, like I said, there's a, a number of other filters um, that are available and you can look at them by clicking this additional filters box. So if you don't see what you want on this default menu, check additional filters because it may be available. Um, so as I said, article type, 
we have a whole bunch of other article types that you could add as a filter. And here's that patient education handout. So let me, uh, so what I'm going to do is um, add this to um, my list of filters so that I can then limit to it um, later. So notice that I click that patient education handout and I now have that as an option to filter under article type. I want to go back down to additional filters. As I said, there's another of other, other things that you can uh, do filter by. Language. Um, there's a number of languages indexed in PubMed. So say you wanted uh, Spanish language, you can, um, can limit to that. Any other number. Um, we also have um, gender, age, and other other filters that you can that you can apply to your searches. Okay, so I've been we've been exploring the filters on the left side of the page, and I use this additional filters feature to add um, the language of Spanish and also the article type um, pa patient education handouts. But just enabling them and seeing them does not filter our search results just yet. See, we still have our 40,000 plus articles. In order to activate a filter that is not a default, you have to first show it from additional filters and then select the filter from the menu, and that will then limit. So as you can see here, I applied a filter to patient education handout, and now I have just patient materials for acid reflux. And then say I only wanted Spanish patient education handouts, then I could then enable the Spanish language filter, and then that gives me four results. Um, and kind of a, another PubMed trivia, um, and this is probably, well, uh, anything that appears in brackets as a title indicates that it is in a, it is not an English language article. So if you are searching um, PubMed and you run across a, a title of an article and it's encased in these brackets, that means that it is not in English. Um, and all of these are encased in brackets because we limited to Spanish only. Okay. Um, and finally, uh, you can also clear all of these filters. There's a green alert button at the top of your search results, and it will say filters applied and which filters you've put in. And if I want to clear them, I can do clear all. PubMed filters are sticky. And what we mean by sticky is that they will stay enabled until you clear them. So if I were like, okay, great, I got my articles moving on to some other search, um, if you're not getting what you want, make sure that you don't still have the same filters applied. And you'll always get this green alert telling you what filters are applied and an option to clear them. I'm going to clear uh, these filters right now. All right, let's see. What do we have in questions? So Melanie has a question. In in search results, sometimes there is, on the top left, above the year results, a short list with several options, including records with mesh, but which I which she says, but which I like. But on some searches, it doesn't appear. So why is this? Hmm. Okay. Um. I, uh, that is a very good question. Uh, I don't have, I have speculation uh, that maybe it was some type of um, user testing, like an A-B testing, and that's why you saw them. Um, I'm not familiar with that shortlist uh, appearing, but I can definitely take that back to PubMed developers and, and ask them why that is and hopefully give you an answer in our, when we send out the answers to questions with a recording. Um, so, sorry I'm not more helpful with that, Melanie. Um, now, one thing I do want to mention, though, um, another, another thing that might be happening here is if you are on a public computer in a library and someone was searching PubMed before you, they may have set an additional filter uh, to Medline. 
And what that will do is then give you this Medline list, which is Medline is records with mesh. Um, and, uh, and we go into more about Medline and mesh and all of this in our uh, How PubMed Works mesh class next week, but um, that might be another reason why. Um, and if there's anybody here today that is a, um, a power PubMed searcher and, and, you, and you want just Medline records, uh, you, can, you can set up that filter under other Medline. Um, yeah, I, I don't. Uh, I don't know, but I am. I am curious with that, and I am going to take that back to our uh, developer team to see. Uh, uh, Sometimes they may have been doing some user A/B testing, and and you happen to be um, one of the lucky people to get that. Um, so she goes on to say that on she's on her work PC, so maybe it's something set up for their institution. So anyway, mm -hmm. okay, good, good to find. Okay. And there are a couple other questions. Um, okay. So Lee uh, remarks that I've seen footnotes in articles that do not have articles in PubMed matching the information in the footnote. So I'm not sure if that's a question or just an observation. And then uh, it goes on to say, is it possible to submit a question to PubMed asking, their, asking if there is an article with the following information? Um. Well, yes, there is a there is a route to uh, contact the help desk on every PubMed page down here under help, um, and you can go to write write to the help desk and um, and send and send your question um, that way. There's also a number of um, help topics available, um, and generally uh, the help desk does not. Mm, do a do a topic search for you necessarily, but um, they can if if you're needing to fix something in a citation, um, they uh, uh, they can they can help direct you to who to contact to get that fixed. Um, but uh, but yes, um, it's uh, it, it yeah okay. Let's see what else. Uh, Prashant asks, what is Medline? Uh, Prashant, we did, uh, there's a link on your handout, Medline, PubMed, PubMed Central, what's the difference? And, uh, and that will give you a, a lot of information about Medline, but, and we also go into that in depth in our How PubMed Works medical subject headings, but uh, Medline is a um, corpus of citations within PubMed that have been assigned medical subject headings. Um, and uh, that's, the, that's the short answer. <laughs> so let's see, what else do we have here? So you might go on and explain the difference between Medline and Medline Plus, because that's the quick follow-up to that question. Oh, okay. Uh, Med, uh, so Medline Plus is the consumer or patient health um, consumer or patient health website that is developed by the National Library of Medicine. Um, and that and that gives you um, it's from the uh, United States National Library of Medicine and it is an online health information resource for patients and their families and caregivers. Um, and this, this is uh, targeted towards consumers and patients. So it is written um, with an audience in mind that are not scientists and researchers. It's plain language. Um, links are all vetted and from authoritative um, government entities and associations. And um, that's, the, that's the short version of Medline Plus. I encourage you to check that out. But Back in the day, a long time ago, when they invented Medline and they started indexing pub citations in PubMed, they then decided to call the consumer health version Medline Plus because it's not confusing at all. And I'm being sarcastic. But um, so MedlinePlus.gov is an excellent patient health website. I recommend it to my family and, and friends, um, and I encourage you to check that out. Um, and let me see. Yeah, Christy has a question. Can you see that one? Um, oh yes, okay. Christy, remove one. I want to only remove one filter. Can I just unclick that box on the filters link? Yes, yes, you can. Um, I'm, let me just get back to my pages here. Yes, uh, you can. As I said, PubMed is sticky, so uh, I cleared my filters, but notice that the patient education handout is still here on my filters menu, and it will stay there. Um, unless I go back into additional filters and then um, I believe there was a, I thought I saw a reset in here. I'm not seeing it now, but then you can, un, you can uncheck 
if you don't want to see it anymore. But, um, and then that will re remove it from the default. So yes, short answer, yes. And then Nancy has a comment that's good to share. Mm -hmm. I've customized my interface through my My NCBI account. I have the Medline filter set to display at the top of my screen. Oh, nice. That is another nice feature of the uh, My NCBI account. And um, if, if you're not familiar with it, it's a free account. Uh, and again, you log in to you have an account to create alerts as well but um, I'm not going to log in today because it is um, like everything two-factor authentication and all of this stuff but you can essentially tie a um, university account if you're affiliated with a university um, you can tie in your login to your my NCBI account you can also create a free login using your Google account um, or um, login.gov is a, another another way um, to do that and then you can customize your search interface there as well. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great tip, Nancy. Thank you. All right, I think we can move on. Great, okay. I'm gonna go back to, um... no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Okay, so, so just to, uh, those were great questions. Thank you so much. And I'd like to also just thank you once more for spending 90 minutes of your of your day here learning about PubMed um, and congratulate you because uh, you are over an hour in. So hopefully you've gotten a couple of good tips here, um, either from myself or some of our um, some some of your your fellow learners. Um, so I'd like to, to close out uh, today by talking a little bit about um, the advanced search builder in history. Um, uh, because uh, you can use the the advanced search builder shows you kind of what's going on behind the scenes of what you're searching uh, and, and it will answer this question why did I get gastroesophageal when I searched acid reflux um, so the advanced search builder and search history are located under the advanced option in PubMed which is right below the search box under advanced and if you go to the uh, PubMed PubMed.gov, the, the landing page, it's also available here. Um, so I'm going to, uh, to click on that advanced link to go to the uh, PubMed Advanced Search Builder. And if you, were, um, if you were on this acid reflux search results page, advanced is right here on the, on the right, right underneath the search box. I'm sorry, the left underneath the search box. And clicking on advanced takes us to our advanced search builder. <coughs> Okay, you can use uh, the Advanced Search Builder to search specific records of a field, or specific fields of a record, and you can also build more complex searches here. Um, so we're going to use the example of searching for a journal. Like, um, say you want to find articles from a specific journal, um, but maybe you're not sure of the journal's exact name. Um, you can use the Advanced Search Builder to find, find that information. So what I'm going to do is under this All Fields, this is a uh, drop-down menu. I'm going to hit the drop-down menu, and I'm going to use this Field Selector to, to start searching for a journal. So the first thing I need is Journal. It's an alphabetical list on the Field Selector. And then at this point, I'm, uh, say I'm trying to find New England Journal of Medicine, but I don't know if it's the New England Journal of Medicine or New England Journal of Medicine or NEJM. I just don't know. So I'm just going to start typing what I think is the start of the journal name, uh, New England. And notice that we start getting some auto-suggestions populating in this menu. Um, and what we're looking for is the New England Journal of Medicine. And so if I select that, as the journal, um, that will give me um, the that will that will let me find articles from a specific journal, even if I don't know the name. Okay, and uh, this is search example D on your handout if you um, if you want to follow along. So I've selected the New England Journal of Medicine from the uh, journal field. Now I'm going to um, click Add. 
Um, and what that will do is pop my search into the query box down here. And now from here, I could search um, and get all of the articles from New England Journal of Medicine as search results. But I can also, using this little caret menu next to search, add this query for the journal to my search history. And I'm going to go ahead and do that. Because then, and, and I'm scrolling down a little bit to the search history and de details uh, underneath the query box, then I can see how many results I have, but I don't have to look at the search results yet. Um, and that's, that's kind of nice if I don't want to immediately see the search results because I'm building a more complex search. So, um, so what I did is added the journal into my field selector, added it, and then added it to my history. Okay, now um, I want to show you a little bit more about the history and search details area of the advanced search because this keeps track of all the searches we've run and it allows us to quickly jump back to search results for searches that we've already run. This search history is retained for eight hours of inactivity. Um, so you can go and walk away and come back as long as it's within eight hours, your search history should uh, still remain um, on PubMed.gov. Now, if you want to keep track of your history longer than that, you can download um, your CSV file of your history and search details here as well. The other thing that you can do under your history and search details is combine previous searches. Um, so if I wanted to um, combine the New England Journal of Medicine, so notice I, I click the three dots under the action menus and it pops my search back up here into the query box. And now say I wanted to add acid reflux, I can add that with the word and, and that will search the New England Journal of Medicine for the search terms acid reflux. Um, so that's kind of cool. And then I can add that search to history and then I'd say, and then I can immediately see, okay, I have 114 articles. Are any of them worth it? And I can click on the results and, and look at the results if I wanted to do that. Now the other cool thing that you can do in the history and search details is uh, view the details of a search. So going back to that acid reflux example um, that we had earlier, um, I can look here under my search acid reflux under details by clicking this caret menu and it will show me my search for acid reflux was interpreted using automatic term mapping to include the term gastroesophageal reflux and a variety of other terms. Um, and that's how we find we found those bolded um, gastroesophageal in those uh, in our search results is because it's mapped our search term acid reflux to gastroesophageal reflux. There's a couple of questions or question okay. repeated. Um, yeah, let's see. Can you export your search history as a PDF, or do you need to copy uh, and paste to save it? You can, the option is you can download your results as a CSV file. Um, if you wanted to export it as a search history, um, most browsers allow you to print a, print a page as a PDF, um, but, but the, the way that is offered in PubMed is to download a CSV file. Yeah, and then Lee commented on the question that he, um, uh, they print my advanced search history as a PDF when I get done. So. Good tip there. Hmm. Another question is, can you upload a search that was present in your history and subsequently download, download it, especially if it is particularly complex? No, that is not a feature in PubMed. Okay. And then, does that CSV include the details when you download, the, download it from its history and search? I believe it does. Let's go ahead and, uh, and see. Good questions. <laughs> yeah, I like that question. I'm curious. Uh, so yes, as you can see here, uh, we do get the search details available, and um, and this is 
Bethany, this is not like a, a great answer, but you, you can, when you download a CSV of your search history, you will get the search details. Um, but there's no, no automatic way to like reload that. Um, now, if you had a, if you logged into my NCBI and created an alert, uh, then your search can be saved that way. Okay. Any more questions, Margie? No, I think we're good. Okay. Okay. So, um, we are headed towards the last 10 minutes of how PubMed works introduction. And I just want to thank you once again you, for the great uh, questions in chat, like really making us work today. So I, 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 I do appreciate that. I do love that a little bit. And now um, I have a question for you. Um, if you're on the advanced search builder, or even if you're not, what I'd like you to do is search the term nosebleed and tell me what it says in the search details. What is the official medical subject heading for nosebleed? And you can share with me in chat. How would I find the official mesh term for nosebleed? Oh, Rachel's got it. Epistaxis. All right. Good job, everybody. Annie Anupa, Melissa. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, yes, uh, epistaxis is the uh, is the official official term of nosebleed, and uh, I can I can do that. I can I actually search it in search it in the query box. And look at my search details, and it tells me the epistaxis is right there, um, and how many search results I can get. Did you know that you can use, I believe, bacon to stop a nosebleed? Uh, there is a very interesting. Um, anyway, I, I love uh, if you if you work with first year medical students or incoming health prof incoming health professional students, this is always a great brain teaser for them, um, and some someone will know the answer. But that's a great um, that's a great. A great practice exercise. Um, but really the bottom line here with the, with the search history and advanced filter is um, search details can really be your best friend when you're trying to figure out how PubMed is work, working and, and what it is searching for because it will, it will tell you what um, subject headings it's mapped to and the other words that it's searching. Um, search details is especially useful if you are searching an acronym for something. There's a lot of different acronyms in healthcare. Um, search details will tell you if, if it's mapping to the proper acronym or a completely different field. Um, so, so definitely check those search details um, when you're doing when you're doing searches if you want to know how PubMed is working on your search results. Um, another fun piece of PubMed trivia: that uh, PubMed logo, um, the Advanced Search Builder, is the only page in PubMed where it appears on the right hand side of the screen. And if I click on that and I go back to the back to the home page of PubMed, it's on the left. Um, but just know that you can always click on this PubMed logo to go back to a fresh, clean screen. And you can always click on advanced search from any page in PubMed to see what you've been doing um, and how it has been interpreted by PubMed. There's one more question about searching for articles. Okay. Um, okay. And it's at, this is from Lee. I have a particular way I would like to search for articles by particular authors. I would like to search for all the articles by an author's name. I would like to also download the affiliations for that author's name and nothing else. Is there a way just to download a particular author's name and, and just that author's AD affiliations to try to focus on picking which articles are by the author of interest and exclude other authors with similar names? Mm -hmm. Um, Lee, we're going to have to put a pin in that and get back to you because that is, that is a great yeah. complex question and um, we, we will be downloading the chat for this um, and pulling out the, the specific questions that everybody has asked and, and get you some more information on that. That's, that's just, um, I, I, I'm going to have yeah. to do a little bit of looking on that, but thank you so much. We will, we will get back to you, Lee. And then there's one more after that. It says, this is from Anita. When you are looking for a specific article, can you use Citation Matcher as well as PubMed Search? 
Yes, you can. Uh, and, and thank you, Anita, for, for asking about that, because I did want to spend just a 90 seconds on things below the fold on the, on the homepage of PubMed. And one of those is that single citation matcher, which has been around for a real long time. And, and yes, this is a way that you can um, search for, use, uh, if you have pieces of information, this is another way that you can search for those articles. Very popular in interlibrary loan if you work in, um, if you work in a, a library. Um, so thank you for asking that. That's a single citation matcher. And then, and of course, we talked about the PMID as a way to get back to one article, but single citation matcher is another. Um, a couple more things uh, just to highlight um, as we're closing out here. Um, PubMed offers a variety of ways to learn, find, download, and explore our resources. Um, if you want to get some um, FAQs and user guides, that's under Learn. Um, we also have uh, the advanced search links. Clinical queries is great if you work with uh, clinicians. Uh, you can limit to clinical studies, and that will give you things um, uh, related to uh, therapy, diagnosis, etiology, and you can do a, a broader narrow scope. There's also a filter for COVID-19 if you are uh, working with COVID-19 researchers, and these all use clinical filters so that will give you targeted clinical information versus um, uh, versus kind of the wide swath of PubMed. There are 36 million citations in here, so it can get a little a little busy. Um, so that's clinical queries. Uh, there's APIs available to download. If you're interested in that, uh, you can um, you can download the uh, eUtilities API um, to uh, to use uh, PubMed data in different ways. And there's more information there under download. Um, and Explore gives you um, a couple other National Library of Medicine databases, such as the Medical Subject Headings database. We'll be talking about Mesh uh, later later this month in our uh, How PubMed Works Mesh class. And then you also, if you are interested in what journals are indexed in PubMed, because there's a lot, you can look at our uh, journals database, and that can answer the question, is this journal indexed in PubMed? Further down the fold, you have trending articles. These are articles that have received lots of clicks lately. Um, and there's also um, latest literature from highly accessed journals. So if you are um, interested in those, in those, you can see that way down at the bottom. We have, as I said before, the help desk. Um, this is a one, one stop shop to write the help desk. Um, get in touch with colleagues at the National Library of Medicine about your questions. Um, there's also a robust um, help topics available. Um, and you can search those too. <clears throat> um, and I think at this point, uh, we want to make sure that we get you that, um, get you that evaluation, um, which will link you to, uh, continuing education credit, uh, if you are interested in obtaining that from the Medical Library Association. Margie's going to share that link in the chat box, um, and, uh, so you can, uh, get some, continuing education credit for the time spent with us today. Um, really, really want to thank all of y'all for spending spending some of your afternoon learning about PubMed today. Um, thank you so much for your great questions. Like I said, we will um, we'll get you some answers for, for uh, the ones we couldn't get to uh, in during the live class. We hope you enjoyed and learned something. Um, and we hope you can join us for the rest of the series. Uh, I'd also like to say thank you so much to Margie. Uh, again, she's uh, Region 3, and that is, uh, what is that, Texas, Arkansas? Um, Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, Missouri, Kansas, and Nebraska. Oh, wonderful. Well, if you're joining us from one of those states, um, say hi to Margie next time, uh, next time around. I have a really popular series Region 3 does is Health Bites. I encourage you to check that out, too. Thank you so much for joining us today, and, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the Network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel, or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.